In today's video, we are going over an evidence-based guide to cervical radiculopathy. Let's do it. This is part four on our series on cervical radiculopathy. If you missed the prior parts, I'll leave a link in the show notes. Check those out before you continue. So what are some of the best treatments for cervical radiculopathy? Let's say you rolled in cervical radiculopathy with your patient. You want to treat them appropriately. What kind of stuff can you do? Well, the big one is going to be exercise, right? And largely exercise seems to be a good treatment for these folks. So Liang et al. in 2019 did a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at the effects of exercise on cervical radiculopathy. They had 10 studies, 871 participants. So as far as physical therapy studies go, that's actually pretty dang big, right? So decent study. And basically in the control group, and keep in mind, this was a systematic review of meta-analysis, so it's multiple different control groups. Uh, generally speaking, there was a, a variety of different treatments that were mostly passive. So think about massage, acupuncture, or ultrasound, right? And they compare the control group, which is mostly passive treatments, against an active intervention group, right? And these folks had some sort of exercise treatment. Uh, what's a little frustrating is I wasn't able to access all the papers to see exactly which exercises they used in the papers where I could find uh, and see those exercises. I've shared a little bit of that information for you so you can see the exact treatments you can use with your patients that have shown to be effective, right? Uh, but largely these studies in the active exercise group, they're doing some sort of exercise specific to the neck. It could be some scapular strengthening exercises some upper extremity strengthening. So think about doing a row, pull down, a press, or some postural correction drill. So think about standing tall, shoulders kind of back and down, tucking that chin in, okay? Those were kind of the treatments you'll see in the majority of these studies. The outcome measure in most of these studies were going to be VAS, pain. So how much pain do you have on a scale of zero to 10 prior to the treatment and then after the treatment, right? Also, they were looking at outcome measures. One of the big ones they used was the neck disability index, and they saw exercise was beneficial for these folks. And the quality of evidence for these studies is actually quite low. Okay. And this is based on the grade level of evidence. Uh, so you can have kind of a low confidence in these results. And I just kind of talked up this study being pretty beneficial, but the level of, of evidence is pretty low in general. I think what you'll find, unfortunately, for a lot of physical therapy pathologies is that the evidence we have is not very high. It's kind of small samples, not a lot of, you know, participants, um, which makes it a little bit tough to hang your hat on any one of these studies as being like a gold standard or a way that you can kind of treat your patients reliably um, because we don't know how accurate these results are. I'd love to see some more research in the future, but suffice to say, this is what we have at this point. So we're going to use this lower quality evidence to guide our treatments, you know, just because more evidence elsewhere doesn't exist. And now I've got a free guide for you today. It's an evidence-based cheat sheet to cervical radiculopathy. We go over all the fundamental basics for diagnosis and treatment of cervical radiculopathy. It's an eight page PDF, and I'll take you from a novice to an expert extremely quickly. I'm going to leave a link in the description so you can go ahead and download that right now and get learning. And lastly, this cheat sheet was specifically made for the lesson today. So I have all of the bullet points in this presentation included in the cheat sheet. And this is really nice. So if you download it, you can follow along with today's lesson. And the other piece is that a couple months from now, if you're like, ah, oh, man, I kind of forgot what Dan said about cervical radiculopathy. You have a new patient coming in tomorrow and you want to make sure you do a good job. You can just take a look at the cheat sheet, reference it and just nail your examination. So one of the studies included in this meta-analysis was from Kuj Per et al. in 2009. And they were looking at acute cervical radiculopathy. So people with a recent onset of cervical radiculopathy, not folks have had this for multiple years, right? Basically, they were looking at physical therapy versus putting patients in a semi-hard collar for three to six weeks versus a wait list. So people didn't get any sort of treatment, okay? Or maybe they did. They just weren't getting some sort of structured therapy or care, okay? Now, in the short term, the physical therapy group had reductions in pain and improved disability over control, okay? So immediately in the first four weeks or so, these folks tend to seem tended to do better compared to the control group. They also had similar improvements with the collar group over the control. So what's very interesting in this study is that if you intervene with an active exercise program for folks, or if you just gave them a cervical collar, both of those things help those patients above the control group. However, in the long term, so at the six month mark, there was no difference between all groups. 
Okay. Which kind of begs this question. Do we need to actually intervene with these patients? Because if we just let them go over the course of six months, they seem to kind of get to the same place. Okay. So I see this argument all over social media and I get it. And I think for patients that are okay, just dealing with their symptoms, if they're not that bad, then yeah, it seems like that's actually a pretty good option. All right. However, this study does kind of lead you to make the conclusion that if your patient has a bunch of pain and you want them to get better faster, then we can intervene with some exercise or a collar. So what did the physical therapy program look like for these participants? Well, patients went to physical therapy two times a week for six weeks and their exercises. I love this exercise because they basically were like bodybuilders. Okay. Which is awesome because I love using strength training for my patients to have all sorts of pain. Looks like cervical radiculopathy is no different. You can actually just do weight training and it's going to help those patients just like weight training helps with lumbar spine issues, cervical spine issues, shoulder issues, so on and so forth. seems like a phenomenal treatment, at least a good choice. Okay. It doesn't have to be the only exercise that you prescribe for your patients, but these exercises were graded, which just means they start with less weight. And over the course of time, as patients get stronger, they add more and more and more weight, right? What kind of exercises were these folks doing at physical therapy? They were doing chest press, lat pull downs. They were doing rear delt flies. They were doing dumbbell overhead press, which is awesome because these patients have neck pain and they're pressing overhead with dumbbells. Pretty cool. Front raises, upright rows, and trunk rotations. So honestly, it sounds like a, a beefy upper body strength day is what it sounds like with maybe a little extra emphasis on the pressing muscles, right? Which is cool because if you just strength train, do a bunch of lifts in the gym, it seems to help with this condition. So great. These patients were also given a home exercise program to be performed every single day. And this program was much more neck specific. They were prescribed two sets of 10 of standing and seated chin tucks, chin tuck with a head lift, chin tuck with a head lift and rotation, cervical lateral flexion and extension isometric. So basically putting their hand against their head, trying to push against their hand, not moving isometric contraction. They're given scap retractions, self resisted lateral flexion and rotation. So a lot of isometrics, a lot of chin tucks exercises on their home program days. And again, these guys had some pretty good improvements. If you guys like what you're learning about so far, then the next logical step is to sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course. I've made an absolutely free mini course and we go over four vital lessons for coaches and clinicians. The first lesson goes over how traditional schooling has failed us. Now I'm actually a really big fan of education and I think that physical therapy school actually prepared me pretty well to work with the average person. However, I really didn't learn how to work with the population that I want, which is people in the strength and fitness world. So I'm talking about powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting, sport of fitness, and really people that just love working hard in the gym. And really my goal with the mini course is to help you understand how you work with this population to get them out of pain and keep them training. The next lesson is seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym. So it's vitally important. They understand the injury mechanisms or why people get hurt in the gym. If we don't understand why folks are getting hurt in the gym, it's going to be very hard to rehabilitate those folks because let's say we do get them better. They go right back in the gym and get hurt in the same exact way they hurt before. The other piece is if we want to keep these folks safe for the long haul, we have to understand the main reason why these folks get hurt in the first place so we can keep them in the gym training as safe as possible and minimize that risk of future injury. Next, we go over four simple steps for getting your clients out of pain. Now, rehab can be very complicated. There's a lot of systems out there that make it very challenging to figure out how to work with your patients. However, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. So I go over four easy steps you can follow to get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. Lesson number four is how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. Let's face it. The reason why you take these educational courses is obviously so you can learn a little bit more, but really the deep seat of reason is because you want to have the respect of your community. You want your clients to come in, work with you and say, wow, Joe was great. He did a phenomenal job with me tell their friends and their friends come to see you. And after a while, you're very valued and respected within your community. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. The second piece is that if you know these skills, it doesn't always mean you have a ton of patients going through the door so you can work with the population you want to work with, right? So you may be the absolute best coach in the world, but no one wants to come and see you because they don't know who you are and they don't know how good you actually are. So we'll teach you how to get the patients through the door that you want to work with. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification. This is the largest and most comprehensive educational course that I offer, but more on this later.
So I'll leave a link in the description, in the show notes. Again, it's 100% free, really easy to download. Go ahead and do that right now. And now back to your learning. So what's better for your patients, a more specific exercise program or a more general exercise program? Basically, if we do a bunch of exercises that are very specific to the neck versus just giving people general exercise, are we going to have the same effect? Or is the neck program going to be a little bit better? Is general exercise a little bit better? Well, Dettering et al. in 2018 attempted to solve this question for us. The name of the study was the effects of neck-specific training versus prescribed physical activity on pain and disability in patients with cervical radiculopathy, a randomized control trial. Okay, so good evidence for us. One of the authors was uh, Joshua Cleland on this paper. He tends to do a really good job. I'm a big fan of his research, right? They were looking at 144 patients with cervical radiculopathy, radiculopathy, excuse me, and they were given either three months of neck-specific exercises, and we're going to go in-depth on what those exercises were, um, and compared it to general physical activity. What I think is important is that they gave the folks in the general physical activity motivational interviewing on top of a programmed exercise, which was not given to the specific neck exercise group. So who knows? Uh, maybe that has an effect on the results. For both these groups, they were given a cognitive behavioral approach, right? Uh, so there is a form of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy, which we know has been shown to be helpful for folks that do have pain. And they tried to use some of these strategies while helping patients in the neck specific group, as well as the general physical activity group. So the neck specific exercise program is actually a program that's been studied before, mostly in whiplash patients, right? So I have this, it's citation number 23. I'm going to leave a link for the references in the show notes. If you guys want to download and see the exact exercises, sets, reps, so on, so forth, progressions, uh, you're welcome to, right? I'm going to briefly describe it now, but if you want to apply this to your patients, you certainly could, right? So these patients underwent physiotherapy three times per week, and they also had a home exercise program on their off day, right? Stage one of this program has a visualized motion. So basically, if you lay on your back, you're going to visualize turning your head to the side, turning it to the other side, extending it, flexing it, all the motions, right? Except you're not actually moving your neck. So their stage one was thinking about moving, but not actually moving. Stage two actually had a little bit of motion. That was things like chin tucks, isometric flexion, and isometric rotation. In stage three, these were gym exercises, so cable-resisted isometrics, inclined board isometrics for endurance. So imagine lying on an inclined bench and picking up your body so that you're statically holding yourself in place, and it strains, obviously, your core as well as your neck, right? Band and cable-resisted rotation. So essentially, these patients had a cable attached to a machine, attached to a strap around their head. And when they rotated, they got a little extra resistance from the cable. Stage four in the Dettering study was liking this video and subscribing to the channel. I'm just kidding. That didn't happen, but you should like the video and subscribe to the channel. The Dettering group, like I said, also had a home exercise program and the home exercise program to be done on off days is going to consist of band cervical isometrics in all directions, as well as band cervical rotation. So basically you have a band against the wall. Band is held in your mouth, biting the band with your teeth, and then turning side to side, getting some resistive rotation there. And lastly, this group included a continuous physiotherapist-guided behavioral approach targeting management of pain and stress, coping, educational breathing, relaxation, pacing, and ergonomics. And the reason being is that as physical therapists, we're often trying to improve a patient's ergonomics, the way they move throughout the course of the day. So it's a little bit nicer on the neck, reduces some stress there and helps people feel better. The other point is that stress has a pretty good correlation with neck pain. So they're trying to address that somehow. Again, I really like Cleland studies just because they tend to do a uh, program that's actually quite similar to what most patients will typically get in a physical therapy setting, right? Sometimes the studies you read, the exercise they give, it's, it's not what most physical therapists do, right? Oftentimes a physical therapist is going to try to improve a variety of different things as opposed to just blanket giving you an exercise program. Although some physical therapy facilities will give you a blanket exercise program. So what did patients in the general physical activity group get? They were given aerobic and or muscular activity, okay? And basically, the aerobic exercises, folks could walk, they could run, they could do anything that's going to get your heart rate up, right? 
in any muscular activity group, they're just strength training. Okay. And basically these programs were individualized to the patient. So if the patient kind of liked more strength training, if they like more endurance training, they would give them a program based on their individual preferences. These sessions were three times a week for 30 minutes. And they're also delivered with some motivational interviewing. So motivational interviewing is a strategy to improve patients outcomes by improving therapeutic alliance, improving rapport, right? So if we're doing this while we're delivering exercises, hopefully we improve compliance for our patients, right? Now this was not included in the other group, although the other group obviously got a lot of cool stuff, right? But the results are pretty fascinating. In the follow-up of this study, so at 3, 6, 12, and 24 months, we were looking at outcomes of neck pain, arm pain, as well as headaches using a VAS questionnaire. We looked at NDI, Neck Disability Index, FABQ, Fear Avoidance Belief Questionnaire, European Quality of Life 5-Day. I'm not familiar with that outcome assessment, but it seems like a quality of life assessment. And then Hospital Anxiety Depression Scale. So I think this is important because neck pain can cause anxiety and depression, right? And then anxiety and depression can also correlate with pain. So it's kind of neat that we're looking at these things and kind of assessing the efficacy of the program based on them. So what were the results of this study, right? So both groups improved all aspects over the course of time. And there was no difference between groups. And this is very interesting because one group was very in depth right? Very specific about their exercise prescription for the neck. The other group, much more general, do what you like, some sort of aerobic exercise or weight training, right? Three times a week, which is very reasonable. And they had the same outcome over the course of time. So a little sad, but it looks like if we have a very comprehensive neck specific program, it doesn't necessarily win out compared to general physical activity, right? And I think that that is frustrating to learn because I thought that the folks in this study put a lot of thought and effort into the program. Uh, but at the end of the day, just the general activity performed just as well. And although that's frustrating, I think the other part of that is that you have your options open. So if you would like to give someone a program that's very specific to the neck, that seems to really help. But the other piece is that you can also just give them physical activity and that actually seems to help just the same, right? Pretty dang cool. I think the last piece that we should consider is that there was no control group, right? And largely we know that performing exercise is usually going to be better than not performing any exercise at all. But in the long term, six months or more, the result may be just the same. So we might not have to exercise whatsoever and just let these folks kind of go, right? That's the common argument. Uh, what I will say is that short term, probably better to exercise. But they didn't include a control group where they did nothing. There was no kind of wait and see group included in this study, right? And that's important to note. So now that you know more about cervical radiculopathy, you still need to know how to do all the special tests to rule in or rule out this condition. I have a great video for you. I'll leave a link in the corner right over there. Click on that and continue the learning. I'll see you on that next video. If you're interested in the references, I'll leave them in the description in the show notes. You can definitely check those out. Lastly, I just want to say thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button. If you leave a comment, it helps the algorithm. I'd also love to know your thoughts on this presentation today. Please subscribe to the channel. It helps me out tremendously. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, please consider leaving me a positive review. Again, it helps tremendously. If you want to see more content like this in the future, we got to make sure we grow this over the course of time, right? And lastly, if you want to support me even further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain Free Insiders. This is going to be my premium subscription membership to Fitness Pain Free, where all my best content updated monthly uh, lives. So head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders online library, just $1 for a week trial. Also leave a link in the show notes in the description. All right, go ahead and check it out.